company's current forecast of aspects of its future business. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from historical performance or current expectations. Risk factors are included in today's press release on the company's Fiscal 2020 Form 10-K and Fiscal 2021 Form 8-Ks on file with the SEC. Now I'd like to turn the call over to Barbara Rentman, Chief Executive Officer. Good afternoon. Joining me on our call today are Michael Hartrunk, Group President and Chief Operating Officer, Travis Marquette, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and Connie Cow, Group Vice President, Investor Relations. We'll begin our call today with a review of our first quarter performance, followed by our outlook for the second quarter and fiscal year. Afterwards, we'll be happy to respond to any questions you may have. As noted in today's press release, first quarter sales significantly exceeded our expectations as we benefited considerably from a combination of government stimulus payments, ongoing vaccine rollouts, easing of COVID restrictions, and pent-up consumer demand. In addition, customers responded enthusiastically to the broad assortments of great bargains we offered throughout our stores. Earnings per share for the 13 weeks ended May 1st, 2021, grew 17% to $1.34 on net income of $476 million. This compares to $1.15 per share or net earnings of $421 million for the 13 weeks ended May 4th, 2019. Total sales for the quarter were $4.5 billion, with comparable store sales up a robust 13% versus 2019. As previously announced, financial results and guidance throughout fiscal 21 will be compared against fiscal 2019. We believe the significant impact from the extended closure of our operations in the spring of 2020 and the disruptions caused by COVID-19 throughout last year make this a more relevant basis for comparison. For the first quarter, home was the best performing major merchandise area, while the Midwest was the strongest region. Similar to Roth, Didi's discounts business trends significantly improved during the quarter. Results were far above our expectations with outstanding sales gains and a rebound in operating profits for the period. At quarter end, consolidated inventories were down 6% versus 2019. Packaway levels ended at 34% of the total compared to 44% for the same period in 2019 as we used a substantial amount of Packaway merchandise to support ahead of plan sales. Average selling store inventories were down 1% relative to 2019. As noted in today's release, our board authorized a new program to repurchase $1.5 billion of our common stock through fiscal 2022, with plans to buy back $650 million this year and $850 million in 2022. The reinstatement of our share repurchase program reflects the current strength of our balance sheet, confidence in the company's ability to generate excess cash after funding growth and other capital needs of the business, and our longstanding commitment to enhancing stockholder value and returns. Turning to store growth, our 2021 expansion program is unchanged, with plans to open approximately 20 total locations comprised of 40 Roths and 20 DDs discounts. As usual, these numbers do not reflect our plans to close or relocate about 10 stores. As a reminder, our conservative opening plans this year, especially for the spring season, were set in 2020 during the onset of the pandemic when it was impossible to predict when the health crisis would subside. Looking forward to 2022, we expect to return to our normal annual opening program of approximately 100 new stores. Now Travis Marquette will provide further details on our first quarter results, second quarter guidance, and outlook for the year. Thank you, Barbara. As previously mentioned, comparable store sales increased 13% in the quarter, driven by a larger average basket. While traffic was down slightly compared to 2019, it accelerated significantly relative to the fourth quarter. Operating margin was well above plan at 14.2% compared to 14.1% for the same period in 2019. 
cost of goods sold levered 35 basis points in the quarter. Merchandise margin was up 85 basis points and occupancy levered by 60. These improvements were partially offset by higher freight costs of 75 basis points, mainly driven by the ongoing industry-wide supply chain congestion. In addition, distribution expenses grew 25 basis points, primarily due to higher wages, while buying costs increased by 10. SG&A for the quarter delevered by 25 basis points, mainly due to the operating expenses associated with the pandemic and higher incentive costs given our better than expected first quarter results. Total net COVID related expenses for the period were approximately 35 basis points, the vast majority of which impacted SG&A. Now let's discuss our guidance. As Barbara just mentioned, our projections compare to the same period in 2019. For the 13 weeks ended July 31st, 2021, we are forecasting comparable store sales to be up five to 7%. Earnings per share for the second quarter are projected to be in the range of 80 to 89 cents. The operating statement assumptions that support our second quarter guidance include the following. Total sales are projected to grow nine to 12%. We are projecting operating margin to be 9.2 to 9.9% compared to 13.7% in 2019. This forecast reflects ongoing expense headwinds from increased freight costs and higher wages. In addition, COVID-related expenses are projected to negatively impact EBIT margins by approximately 100 basis points in the period as we return to pre-pandemic store operating standards while still maintaining many of the extra cleaning routines. We expect to open 30 stores during the second quarter, consisting of 22 raw, and eight DD's discounts. Net interest expense is estimated to be about $19 million. Our tax rate is expected to be approximately 25%. And weighted average diluted shares outstanding are projected to be about 355 million. For the full year, we are projecting annual comparable store sales gains of seven to 9% versus 2019 and earnings per share of $3.93 to $4.20. Operating statement assumptions that support our fiscal 2021 guidance include the following. Total sales are projected to grow 11 to 13%. We project that operating margin for 2021 will be in the range of 10.7 to 11.2% compared to 13.4% in 2019. The forecasted decline again reflects our expectations for continued freight, wage, and COVID cost headwinds through the balance of the year. Net interest expense is estimated to be about $75 million. Our tax rate is projected to be approximately 24 to 25%. And we expect average diluted shares outstanding to be about 354 million. Now I'll turn the call back to Barbara for closing comments. Thank you, Travis. To sum up, we're optimistic about our prospects for the balance of the year and hope to do better than our forecast. This confidence is based on our recent results and ongoing improvements in the macroeconomic environment bolstered by vaccine rollouts and the easing of pandemic-related restrictions. That said, it's difficult to predict the lasting impact from the factors that benefited our first quarter sales results, especially the recent government stimulus payments. As always, we'll remain nimble to address the dynamic consumer and retail landscape while staying focused on delivering the great bargains our customer has come to expect from us. Longer term, we remain confident about our opportunity to gain market share as we expect to benefit significantly from a favorable competitive climate given the large number of retail store closures and bankruptcies in recent years. This, along with the consumer's heightened focus on value and convenience, bodes well for our ability to achieve solid results into the future. At this point, we'd like to open up the call and respond to any questions you may have. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound or hash key. In order to allow everyone time for questions, we ask that you please limit yourselves to one question. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Your first question comes from Matthew Boss from J.P. Morgan. Great, thanks, and congrats on the, on the really strong improvement. So 
Barbara, maybe could you speak to the cadence of business and any notable changes in traffic or category demand as the quarter progressed? And then Travis, on gross margin, I guess maybe just how best to think about the puts and takes in the second quarter that you're embedding relative to 2019. Sure, Matthew. So let's start with category demands. Um, there was really broad, broad base acceleration across all merchandise areas, with obviously home having having very strong performance for us and for other people across the country. But what we did see is a major improvement in apparel. And as we feel as the economy starts to open up, that apparel will continue to strengthen as time goes on. With a lot of change in trends, um, we're monitoring that and we're flexing and moving the business around based off of what the customer is telling us. So we feel in, in totality, we feel overall pretty good about the business go forward. In terms of traffic, Travis, you want to take the traffic piece? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, just let me break down comp a little bit. I mentioned uh, comp was 13%. It was driven by a lar larger average basket size. Um, that was uh, partially offset by lower number of transactions. Traffic was down slightly compared to 2019, but it accelerated significantly um, compared to the fourth quarter. Uh, the increase in the average basket was driven by items per transaction, um, as average unit retail was up slightly. And then I think, and then I think your next question was around uh, just the guidance, the operating margin guidance for Q2. Yeah, just any puts and takes on the second quarter. Yeah, I mean, uh, as, uh, second quarter again, we the overall guidance reflects a couple of things. One, obviously, the comp store gain is expected to be lower than what we saw in the first quarter, and therefore we'll get a little bit less leverage on the business. Um, uh, in addition. Um, uh, on uh, COVID costs, we expect to also be higher, although that will primarily impact SG&A. Uh, we also expect to see continued um, significant pressure on freight. Uh, we saw that in the first quarter, both uh, in ocean freight as well as overall freight, and we uh, think that will those pressures will continue. Great. Best of luck. Your next question comes from Mark Altschweiger from Barrett. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Um, appreciate all the, the detailed guidance. I guess, um, you know, overall, if I have all the numbers down uh, correctly, I think the guide implies um, EBIT margins down about 250 basis points this year versus versus 2019. Just could you characterize that? I mean, how much of the step down is related to the, the COVID costs, which are, you know, hopefully temporary versus some of the more um, kind of pressures on, on freight and wages that could persist moving forward, just trying to think about um, how that EBIT margin might progress as we move beyond this year. Thank you. Mark, it's uh, Michael Hartshorn. Um, we're obviously optimistic about our prospects for the balance of the year, and we hope to do better than our uh, sales and margin forecast. We do expect expense headwinds through the balance of the year, and if you break down the COVID cost at some point, uh, those will not to continue, but we expect them to be in place. Uh, our guidance assumes that they're in place throughout throughout the year. Uh, wage costs we would expect to uh, persist, and uh, at some point, um, freight we would expect to persist throughout the year, and we'll see how that balances out over the coming years. But overall, the recovery to 2019 margin levels it's highly dependent on strong sales performance and over time. And again, the persistence of the cost inflation we're seeing today, especially in things like freight. Your next question comes from Adrian Yee from Barclays. Good afternoon. Um, let me add my congratulations on the top line improvement. Um, Barbara, my first question is for you on the merchandise margin of up 85 basis points. I just want to make sure that that is separate and aside, so you don't have inbound freight in that number because obviously we got a separate number for total freight, so that's number one. And then can you give us the components of AUR versus AUC on that? I'm imagining your AUR is up meaningfully. Are you getting a relative pricing umbrella from frontline, meaning that if you're 20 to 60 percent off frontline and frontline's clean, that you're able to maybe clear at a higher price. And lastly, was mix from home or versus apparel? Um, did home grow faster? 
and was that an impact on uh, the merchandise margin? Thank you so much. Yeah, this is Charles. Let me just take a couple of those uh, that you mentioned. One, just in terms of uh, sure. what's included in merchandise margin, when you say inbound freight, ocean freight is included in that number. Um, and so that's embedded in. And we had mentioned previously that we expected meaningful headwinds from ocean freight, and we, we, we saw those and expect those to continue as we move through the year. Um, and then I think you also had a question about apparel versus non-apparel and sort of the mix. Um, you know, we, see, we saw broad-based uh, improvements across the store, um, but, you know, uh, non-apparel home continued to be uh, the strongest category, but we, we definitely saw an improvement in apparel as well as we, uh, as we moved through the quarter. And then, Adrian, on, on AUR, AUR was up slightly uh, during, the, during the quarter. Okay. And really, All right. Great. And so, go ahead. No, just, just relative, the other part that you're asking about is relative to department stores because they promoted less than their AUR is up? Yes. The pricing, the pricing umbrella. Yeah. So, so our AUR yes. is, is, up, is up slightly. But compared, so that is just, we just offered a greater value to department store pricing at this point in time. You know, the price value equation is, is the business that we're in, the relativity to it. But this, at this yep. moment, our price values are actually stronger than they normally would be to department stores. Okay, great. And, and if I may, um, just on hourly payroll, um, you know, I don't really know how to ask this, but because I know, I know these are sensitive numbers, but if we were to look at freight as a percent of sales, and, I, and now I'm talking about the outbound freight because now I know that the inbound freight's inside the merch margin, um, that, that line that, that deleveraged uh, 75 basis points versus the line item that is wage or hourly payroll, what would be the sort of order of magnitude? Like is, it, is the payroll line three times as much as the freight line or something like that? Just so mentally I, I can understand, like, if one of them is moving materially higher than the other, which has the bigger impact on the PL. Thank you very much. Uh, Adrian, Michael Hartshorn again. We wouldn't give you uh, specifics other than we, what we provided in the guidance, uh, other than to say okay. both, both freight and wages. First on, on freight, given the robust overall economic rebound, there continue, continues to be significant supply chain congestion and costs have increased yep. versus our original expectations. And so our current guidance assumes additional escalation as we move through the year. On, on wages, uh, that also remains very dynamic. We've made market by market adjustments in our stores as we always have to attract talent. Warehousing labor uh, is very competitive and we've made additional adjustments yep. in all of our distribution, distribution centers and that's also reflected in our guidance. Okay, thank you very much. As a reminder, to ask a question, press star one on your telephone. In order to allow everyone time for questions, we ask that you please limit yourselves to one question each. Your next question comes from Kimberly Greenberger from Morgan Stanley. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, Barbara, obviously the, um, the prudent planning for sales going forward, the very conservative plan um, compared to the, the very robust first quarter, that, that seems very, very prudent to us. I'm wondering, um, are you seeing any slowdown so far here in the second quarter um, that sort of uh, underscoring your desire to plan more conservatively or um, are you just looking forward and saying, okay, there, there were some really um, uh, sort of one-time benefits, as it were, that happened here in the first quarter, so it's just naturally prudent for us to plan more conservatively? Kimberly, I think we're, I think we're thinking more about, you know, the first quarter and the, the lasting impact from some of those factors, you know, the stimulus payments that were out there, and, and what does that really mean as we go forward? So we're comfortable with, with the number of where we sit today. Um, but that's really some of those pent-up demand, some of those things that we're not sure how that goes forward with completely at this point. Yeah, I know. It's a very, very uncertain path forward. Thank you for that. Um, and Michael, you talked about um, you've got a plan this year for COVID costs to basically continue through the year. So 
I'm wondering if you can just sort of isolate the COVID costs and based on what you experienced here uh, in the first quarter and then whatever you've got in your forecast for the second, third, and fourth quarter, can you, could you just give us a rough dollar amount of what you're budgeting this year for COVID costs? Um, and, and would it be fair to assume that those costs would roll off in future years? Yeah, hi, Kimberly, this is Travis. Um, but let me just kind of do a little bit of a reset and remind folks kind of how we talk about COVID costs. Um, you know, we report COVID costs as net, which is to say that they include um, pandemic-related increases in costs for things like uh, personal protective equipment, extra cleaning, but there are offsets within that number as well for cost savings that we took for things like travel and, and when we closed our fitting rooms. Um, as the pandemic subsides, apparel is becoming more important. Um, we think it's important uh, to take some actions, including reopening our fitting rooms, which is going to eliminate some of the cost savings that we had before, and it drives up the overall, the overall COVID cost number. Um, for Q1, uh, as we reported, the COVID costs were about 35 basis points on the quarter. Um, for Q2 and going forward, uh, we're estimating those that will, they will be around 100 basis points um, for the balance of the year. Again, that assumes uh, where we are today that we have not removed and we not built into the plan to remove any of the additional cleaning uh, activities and protocols that we've put into place. Having said that, you know, we will continue to monitor guidance from the CDC and other health experts We'll continue to prioritize the health and safety of our associates and our customers. Uh, but to the extent that that guidance changes, then we'll re we could reevaluate some of those protocols and, and, and adjust those plans. And Kimberly, to answer your question on uh, how long they last, the, those costs are not permanent. So as, as the uh, pandemic uh, resides, those costs would come back out of the business. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Your next question comes from Chuck Brown from Gordon Haskett. Hey, thanks, Great Quarter. Um, my question is just on, on the first quarter. You know, you originally got it to comps down 1% to 5% and, and you far exceeded that up 13%. Um, just curious if you guys could just unpack the, the app performance either by category, how much you think was stimulus. Um, just wanted to ask that question. Thanks. Um, yeah, this right. is. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Barbara. Sorry. Okay. So, so if you're talking about by by merchandise category, you know, as I said, oh, yeah, you know, if we could, yeah, start, with, start. We'll start there. So um, it was it was very broad based. Obviously, home is home is you know accelerated for everyone, and we still feel very good about home as we go forward. But the additional acceleration really came out of really came out of apparel, and that was also very broad based as the customer you know, kind of came from just wearing active wear, moving into more real, what I would call real apparel, or even though it's casual, but still broader classifications of products. So, and that was broad based. And so that's why we feel good about apparel as we go forward. And then just overall in the quarter, um, there's, as, as Barbara mentioned in her, her opening comments, there are a number of factors that led to the increase. Um, obviously, the stimulus, very difficult to put a number on $400 billion uh, of stimulus to the consumer that uh, continues, um, will continue federal stimulus. There's also states that have stimulus, so that will continue through the second quarter, if not, if not throughout the year with some of the child uh, uh, credits. Um, there is the uh, vaccine ramping up. Uh, and so cu customers are becoming more and more confident returning to brick and mortar stores. We expect that to continue as the vaccination rates increase. Um, if you look at our regional performance, uh, as we said in the commentary, Midwest was the top performing region. Uh, of our biggest states, California performance improved significantly versus the prior quarter as government restrictions eased and as comp was comp was relatively similar to the chain, chain average. So there's a, a lot of different factors driving the comp in the first quarter. Great. Thanks very much. Your next question comes from Lorraine Hutchinson from Bank of America. Thanks. Good afternoon. Barbara, could you discuss the availability of product in the better trending categories? And then do you think there's sufficient availability for you to start rebuilding your pack away balances into the back half? Uh, sure. 
um, availability in, in the better trending businesses. You know, um, I would say I would say overall the availability is there. It's a chase. You know, we have a large merchant team, and so they're out there looking for the goods constantly. I think there's two things about it. One is, you know, the um, the trends are shifting in front of us, so things are moving very very quickly. So I should start with that. And the trends towards just say like active active apparel to other parts of sportswear are shifting quickly. And so far, I would say we yes, we have been able to chase chase the business, get what we need, get the availability that's out there. It's more getting the combination of kind of getting ahead of the trend that as it's shifting in the outside world, that we're shifting with it and that we get ahead of it. But yes, I feel comfortable that the availability is there in the businesses that the customer wants at this moment in time. And then say it again, uh, Lorraine, what was the second question? I was just um, wondering how you expected Packaway to evolve over the coming quarters, if there's sufficient availability uh, for you to be able to rebuild that. We think we'll build Packway over time, closer to historical levels, but I do think it'll take time as, we're, as we are very much chasing the business. And if that chase were to continue, you know, I think it would, it would take us a little bit of time because Packway fluctuates also. It's not only that the availability is there, it's that it's the right product, the right value, the right, you know, it has to have all the right metrics to be going into Packway at the same time. So I do think it'll take a little bit of time, but but there is sufficient availability to be driving our business and to buy pack away and, and, you know, the total picture. Your next question comes from Ike Barucha from Wells Fargo. Hey, guys. Um, just a quick one for Travis. Just on the freight headwind you gave us for Q1, just curious, should we assume that that should be run rated through the rest of the year or, or to that cost headwind that you have um, – Potentially moderate based on the contracts you guys have. Thanks. Hi, Kyle. Uh, it's Michael. I'll take that. Um, first, the, the, even the contracted rates were significantly higher than, than 2019 levels. In, in addition, uh, like other retailers, we're incurring higher costs to move freight, really, both internationally and domestically. We're spending, we have higher costs uh, to land freight when expected. So, given the uh, robust overall economic rebound. Um, as I said earlier in the call, we expect uh, freight uh, costs to escalate uh, for the remainder of the year, and that's included in our guidance. Thanks. Your next question comes from Michael Benetti from Credit Suisse. Hey, guys. Um, thanks for taking our questions here. I guess two, two quick ones. We see the sales guidance. I appreciate the conservatism. I think it's been, you know, the right move through the year here and with the visibility where it is. But if if sales trends do remain strong, as strong as they were in 1Q relative to what you thought, a pretty significant upside sales scenario, can you tell us how to think about sales flow through in the model relative to the framework you've told us about in the past? And then, Barb, just to a comment you made earlier, why not extend the, the relative value back up to the normal rate relative to the department stores? Uh, why hold it lower if, if they're moving higher, just so we can think alongside you on, on that? Sure. Um, listen, department stores didn't promote as much for the first time in a very long time. And so I think we'd have to see what that, you know, what that looks like because, you know, they're, they're promotional. Okay, they've promoted for years and years and years. So, we, so we've had one quarter under their belt where the, where the AUR is probably higher and they haven't promoted. I think we have to see what happens in the future. And also I think it's important while we can get great values to the customer, you know, price value is absolutely critical to our customer. And so we're going to value the goods the way we, we think the, val the customer expects them, where the customer expects them to be. And so, you know, Raising the AUR and, and changing your value equation is a very delicate thing. And so I think having one quarter underneath our belt with lots of money, stimulus, and lots of things going on in there, driving sales, you know, I think, I think um, it's a re very, very much a remains to be seen, and it is very important and off-price and critical in our business model to offer that price value. The customer is very savvy, you know, and shopping all the time. So... Again, not sustained yet, and department stores don't know how that's really going to land. And then with all the money and the stimulus out there, don't know how to take that as a go-forward strategy to read at this moment in time. 
And it, <clears throat> this is Travis. In terms of the the operating margin flow through on above uh, sales above plan, you know, we continue to expect uh, comp out performance to drive increased operating margin flow through compared to the guidance that we provided. But I don't think it, we would necessarily expect it to be quite as strong as we saw in Q1. Um, but we do expect operating margin improvements as as comp exceeds our plan. And then the the flow through on this guidance would look. Uh, would look like it has historically. Thank you. Your next question comes from Martin Shapiro from Retail Tracker. Hey guys, congrats. Um, and Barbara at the department stores. We all know where they're going. They're going right back to promotions. Um, if you could give me a little bit of guidance around your traffic during the quarter and what you're seeing around things like as schools reopened um, the Easter holiday, did you see a pop around when the stimulus checks pop came, came into hand or around Mother's Day? Just trying to get a feeling about the cadence of the traffic, if it's an everyday or is she also being sparked to come into the store by events? Yeah, th this is Travis. I can talk a bit about hey, the trends. Again, generally, we don't we don't provide sort of detailed uh, traffic trends by month. But mm -hmm. given the timing of tax refunds and stimulus payments, you can imagine that sales were stronger later in the quarter uh, mm -hmm. than at the beginning. In terms of traffic trends, again, um, you know, traffic for us is transactions. It, it, it mirrors pretty close to our sales trends. Fantastic. Best of luck for the summer, guys. Yeah. Your next question comes from Laura Champion from Loop Capital. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, to, to that previous point, um, Travis, when you when you guys set the guidance for um, Q2 sales, did you just take the trend before the stimulus and extrapolate that there, or how did you? What was the basis of that Q2 sales guide? Uh, the comp sales guide. No, again, I think Michael. Um, you know, we've talked about it. There are a number of factors that drove the Q1 performance, um, be it stimulus, pent-up demand, vaccine rollouts, et cetera. And, and it's difficult to, to precisely predict how long some of those will last. And so, um, you know, we, we took that into account and, and, and projected forward what we think is, you know, our current plan and best guess for, for Q2, and we, we certainly hope to do better. Got it. In the back half related to that, is there anything in your, your expectations for um, the benefit from the enhanced child tax credit? And, and historically, when this sort of stimulus has come through, um, do you see it in your numbers? Laura, well, I would say it's hard, hard to say at this point. Um, we've, we've not seen this type of stimulus even in the first quarter uh, in, in, a, in a very long time. Uh, as Travis said, um, you know, we set a baseline and we clearly hope we can do better than these, uh, the, the guidance that we put out. Understood. Thank you. Your next question comes from Jay Sully from UBS. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much. You know, my question is about the full year guidance, specifically about the fourth quarter. Um, when we get to the fourth quarter and get to January, we'll be lapping the stimulus that happened in January. How are you thinking about what impact that might have on the business in, four quarter, in the fourth quarter, and how might fourth quarter sales and gross margin compare to what we saw, um, you know, this past year? Yeah, I think we'll, uh, we'll provide guidance as we move through the year. Right now, we typically provide uh, guidance quarter by quarter, so we'll have more to say as we move through the year on the fourth quarter. Would you think that the January sales would be down year over year? Uh, we wouldn't comment at this point. Um, got it. All right. Well, then maybe if I can ask one more. Um, are, are you still seeing right now the impacts of stimulus? Is there any way to measure whether whatever you're seeing in May is sort of still a tailwind from the stimulus that was distributed in, in March and April, or is now some other factor become a bigger driver here in May? Yeah, we wouldn't, as, as Barbara said at the beginning, we don't comment on, it's our practice not to comment on intra-quarter trends. I can tell you, uh, you know, certainly in the first quarter, we think stimulus had a, had, had a significant impact, impact among other factors uh, that we called out earlier. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. Your next question comes from Paul Trussell from Deutsche Bank. 
Hi, good afternoon. This is uh, Christina Katai on for Paul. I just wanted to add my congrats on a great quarter. Um, I wanted to circle back to merchandise margin and the strength that has been there for the last three quarters. How do you see the current environment evolving from just a buying perspective? And can you just speak to the sustainability of these trends to potentially drive pre-COVID gross profit margins if you essentially maintain these strong sales trends? Yeah, in terms of the merchandise margin, again, the, the buying environment remains very dynamic. Um, you know, var margins will vary significantly based on our overall sales performance. Um, we've talked uh, over the last several quarters that the buying environment has been quite strong, and we've benefited from that. Obviously, in the first quarter, we also benefited from significant above plan sales, which drove faster turns and, and fewer markdowns. So those were all positive. Um, you know, in terms of how long that sustains, um, you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, we, we have our best guess built into the guidance, and, and, um, and we obviously hope to do better. And to the extent we do, we'd expect to see some, some further benefit. Got it. That's helpful. And um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about more, you know, what you're seeing as it relates to just general consumer willingness to return to your stores. And do you have any data on this? You know, what portion of your pre-pandemic shoppers have returned to shop with you regularly? And are you seeing any demographic changes, perhaps, older consumers are returning to your stores as vaccines are being rolled out here relatively quickly. On the, on the consumer, what we are seeing is uh, the consumer, uh, we've seen our consumer shop less, but they are buying more uh, during their shopping trips. The demographics of our customer base did skew younger during the peak of the pandemic, given older customers' hesitancy to shop in brick and mortar stores. Uh, we believe customers of all ages are returning to stores with the increased vaccination rates, and that's especially true with older customers where the vaccination rates are, are much higher. Overall, we know that she continues to prioritize value and convenience uh, when deciding where to shop. And with the large number of retail closures, uh, she obviously has fewer places to shop now. Great. Right. Best of luck. Your next question comes from Paul Leshway from City. Hey, thanks. It's Tracy Kogan filling in for Paul. I had two questions. I was uh, hoping first you could talk about uh, the marketing spend in the quarter and whether you leveraged uh, that spend and what your expectations are for the year. And then secondly, can you talk about the rent deals that, that you saw, I guess, for the deals you signed last year for the opening this year? And and how that's trended as you're signing uh, new deals right now. Thanks. Sure. On the uh, on the leases, um, you know, the the real estate market is is good. Um, you know, both from a supply standpoint and um, uh, what we're seeing in leases. I wouldn't say specifically on a call like this, but um, you know, the significant of the the uh, rent. Uh, favorability, um, given the number of leases across the whole chain, would not be significant on overall leverage, for instance, um, on, on sales. On marketing, um, you know, for us, marketing continues to be a good reminder to our customers. Over, overall, our strategic uh, uh, investment here uh, it has been to move to more digital. I wouldn't provide more specifics on 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 marketing on on this call just just going back to the real estate any changes from what you were seeing last year versus this year in terms of favorability is it getting better um i'd say i'd say the story is still developing tracy so okay. you know we'll see how it develops over the over the next couple of years obviously the availability is good and we hope to take advantage of that given all the store closures got it thanks very much guys your next question comes from Dana Telsey from Telsey Advisory Group. Good afternoon, everyone, and nice to see the progress. It was mentioned about DDs in the release, and I think a little bit at the beginning. What are you seeing in DDs? It sounds like it took a, an upturn for the, for the better, both in terms of sales and operating profits. And anything to note there on store openings of DDs versus Roth and what you're, what you're seeing either in terms of favorability of leases and also productivity 
um, this year to last this year to two LLY. Thank you. Dana, I, I would say that the uh, the story is very similar uh, for DDs. We did see strong gains in sales and operating uh, profits for the period versus our expectations. I would also say that DDs has a similar wage, freight, and COVID cost expense pressures uh, that we're seeing in Ross. And I would say we feel feel really good about the DDs performance. In terms of new store productivity, we don't break out DD specifically, but overall, uh, new store productivity continues to be in the 60 to 65 percent range that we've we've talked about historically. On the real estate rollout, we would expect to, to uh, beyond this year, uh, DDs uh, grow DDs at 20 to 25 stores per year. Thank you. Your next question comes from Priya Uri Gupta from Barclays. Great, thank you so much for taking the question. I'm just hoping you could update us on your thoughts as to um, potentially uh, continuing to bring down your debt balance given uh, your where the cash balance currently stands and any further thoughts on um, improving the balance sheet. Thank you. Sure, our, our expectation is that we're gonna pay down our existing debt, so we're not going to uh, refinance it. Um, the timing, if it's economically advantageous to pay off early, we would consider it. But if, if not, we would expect to pay off uh, our existing debt at maturity. Thank you so much. That was our last question. I will turn the call over to Barbara Rentner for closing comments. Thank you for joining us today and for your interest in Ross stores. Have a good day. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.